Okay. Hello, everyone. We'll just wait for everyone to get into the room or at least a few of you to get in before we kick things off. So we'll do Maybe that. Thing. It's recording. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like, don't scratch my ass or anything, right? <laughs> 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 oh, fantastic. I, I think that is the perfect uh, tone setter for what is about to uh, happen, I think. <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to start off because I'm going I'm to just introduce things to begin with um, anyway before we, we get into the questions. So I'll speak slowly so that anyone uh, entering the room has a little bit of time to get here and settle in. So hi everyone, welcome to this live Q&A as part of WOW Film Festival 2021. Uh, my name is Nia edwards Behi, and I'm one of the co-directors of Abattoir Horror Festival and it has been such a pleasure for us to be able to present The Long Walk as part of this year's WOW Film Festival and I'm going to assume that all of you who are at this Q&A have already watched it. Um, and it's even more of a pleasure, obviously, to welcome the film's director, Matty Doe, and producer, Anik Manet, to talk about the film with us. So hi to you both. Sabaydi, hola. Sabaydi. How are you both today? Um, I took a nap before this, so I'm like fresh. <laughs> nice, nice. So you're a on few hours couch. ahead of us as well. <laughs> yes, so I napped on this couch and I was like, ding, it's time for Q&A. <laughs> Perfect. So, uh, Matty, you're in. You're joining us from Laos, and Anik, you're joining us from Spain. So this is truly a, a sort of a, a worldwide Q and A that we're having. Um, before I kick off with any questions, I just want to because I know it's it's probably a bit of a mixture of people in the audience. But so I just wanted to um, introduce this, I suppose, by saying as Abattoir is a festival, we're quite fortunate to have quite a, a long working relationship and friendship with both uh, Matty and Anik. I think so. For those who aren't familiar, Matty is literally a ground groundbreaking director, Lau's first female director and only female director, I believe. Um, so far. <laughs> yeah, so far, fingers crossed. The um, first horror filmmaker and sort of a rejuvenator, right, of the, of the industry there. And Anik is a sort of a mainstay of the European and US genre festival circuit as programmer, distributor, sales agent, producer, so many different things. And I just wanted to start by sort of emphasizing those because I think um, Anyone here who's not maybe part of our abattoir audience might not be aware of those things. And because it's important to highlight people's achievements, right? And just how cool it is to be talking to you today. So I'm gonna start off the session. I will shut up in a minute um, with a few of my own questions. I've got quite a lot, but I am gonna be keeping an eye on the Q&A feature. So if you do have any questions yourselves, um, those of you watching out there, um, please use the Q&A function to ask those and I'll be keeping an eye on those and I'll be sure to ask um, the interesting questions, obviously, make them interesting. So I'm gonna start things off by spinning back a little bit. 2016, you both collaborated on Dear Sister, or rather Dear Sister came out in 2016. I'm sure the collaboration was a little earlier than that. And it's a film, yeah. oh, I absolutely love it. So I suppose <laughs> I wanna kind of spin back and start off from there. So you've, you've made this one film together. So I'm wondering how the next one comes about. Did you sort of realize you have made a good partnership? How do you go about Re-collaborating, I suppose, and, and getting to the long walk. Anik, this is you. <laughs> uh, well, I became a producer on their sister kind of by accident. <laughs> um, should I tell the story or not? Um, tell the story because it's so fucking crazy how okay. you became my producer. It's like the dumbest and bestest story ever. <laughs> so I met Maddie. Um, first of all, online, because her first film, Tentally, um, had been talked about on a website then called, um, it wasn't called Screen Anarchy Twitch. then, um, it called, uh, what was it called? Twitch. Twitch. Um, it was called Twitch film. before. And then, and then, so I contacted Maddie because I was interested in doing international sales. I was interested in maybe looking at it for international sales. Um, turned out the film wasn't strong enough for the Western culture, and I told her that, but the film got selected at Fantastic Fest. In Austin, yeah, I was like, she I... hated this film. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. It um, was artsy fartsy as hell. <laughs> it was very slow. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but uh, so Maddie and I met and connected at Fantastic Fest. And then it was the year where Maddie was invited to La Fabrique du Cinéma du Monde at the Cannes Film Festival uh, with her new project. Um, and then The Long Walk. Uh, and then to Toronto as well at the Film Lab. Um, so we kind of connected 
um, at those places again, like uh, Cannes, Toronto, um, and we became friends. And then she was um, invited to pitch the film in France, an hour away from Paris after, um, I think it was, when was it, November, I think, or September, after Toronto. Um, it was in November because there was like the Marché du Noël was out, remember? And I was like, we gotta get hot wine and gingerbread. <laughs> That's why so I called you. I, 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 my thought was, let's just, uh, I'll just visit her. But I didn't want to pay for a hotel room because I was just really cheap. And, and I told her, hey, why don't you try to tell them that your French producer is coming and try to get me a hotel room? And she did. But then the next day I got this official invitation from the festival saying, how happy they were to welcome me as a producer of Maddie Do. And I wasn't, I, it was a bluff to get a free hotel yeah. room. So, we were just getting like Van Schoen, you know, yeah. <laughs> like hot wine. <laughs> so I got there, um, everything was very official. And so I had to learn to pitch with her, the project, because then we had a pitching session the next day to present the project. Uh, but basically to make this short, um, we, I don't know, we just hit it off. We just became very good friends, but I think also the collaboration was just really easy. Um, she trusted me, I trusted her, uh, even though she was the first time, like for me, kind of like newer director, I was, I just trusted her taste and, you know, her decisions and it just worked really well um, on, you know, on the, like, it, it was, it was the rest of another long walk, I switched that, but, but it was just like, I can't explain, it was just organic. Um, and, and then I was just like, well, you know, if, if you wanted to, I don't know how, but if you wanted to, I'll help you produce it. Um, and that led to uh, Dear Sister, which uh, was not an easy production for many, many reasons. But uh, <laughs> None we of our productions through, are easy, Enik. <laughs> we went through kind of like problems with other partners on that, but because we were really connected and because we were trying to achieve the same thing, um we we just really i don't know it was just like solid and then when she came with the long walk she's like hey uh, i have this next project for me it was like I, I think she didn't even think about asking me because it was kind of for her certain that i would you know produce it and it for me it was kind of yeah i'll do your next film and so we're just like coll easy collaboration it was just a no-brainer I, I assume that all the products that i do except for the ones that don't come from myself will have any in some capacity um, and I've been really adamant about that, even though, like I was saying, even though now, like, um, I'm being entertained by larger companies in, in the States now, um, it's just, you know, there are certain people who have always got your back and there are certain people who are always there for you despite problems. And, um, that, you know, I think it's really, it's really, um, important to have someone who can stand up for you when your brain is going like a million miles per second thinking of every every tiny detail, every aspect, every other problem that, that the production is having. Like to have someone there to interface for you is so important, you know? And that's any. <laughs> I love that. I love that it is sort of a, a, a professional relationship based on a, on a personal relationship. I think that's really great. And I suppose maybe does that help at all? So I, I'm going to sort of ask about the narrative of the long walk in it. I know um, from reading around and obviously doing my research that it's kind of um, as a narrative has sort of evolved before reaching that final product. So I wonder, does it make it easier when you then bring those sort of quite personal aspects to a story that maybe you, you want to talk about, Matty? Mm, I mean, the kinds of productions that I do are very unique. Um, I am shooting with a tiny crew. The Long Walk is probably the largest crew we've ever had, right? And with like almost 20 people, which is by British um, standards or by UK standards, it's like immensely small. But that was the largest crew I'd ever had. But we are in the jungle with little to no equipment, um, just facing the elements and working with non-actors um, in a country without the kind of infrastructure or support to make a film like we're making. So having someone like any who is very personally involved in my life, who has been here before, who has gone through the problems that we've had on our production helps a lot because like it is really difficult to explain to Westerners um, the sorts of uh, obstacles and challenges that they'll have to face when they're here. No matter how like 
no matter how much we try to tell them that it's not, it's a third world country. Um, and it's going to be like making a film on the shittiest camping trip you've ever, ever been on. Um, it just never really registers. But the reason why I pick a lot of crew members who are very uh, intimate with us already is because of this. Like, I don't have to go through this hurdle of babysitting people when they're on set, you know, because when they reach here, we should just be thinking about making the film and not transitioning to whether or not we have freaking like soy lattes or not. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, we don't. That sort of, by the way, I'm sorry, <laughs> Damn. Um, that kind of ties in. I've, I've just spotted one of the Q, the questions. Thank you for the for the, the, the questions coming in already on the Q and A. So I'm going to interject one into into mine. Um, uh, so this is a question from Sarah, and she says that she loved your film. Congratulations. Hi, thanks, Sarah. Sarah, what? Sarah the Crowther. Was? Crowther. Sarah Crowder, long, long time <laughs> friend of Abbotswell. Oh. <laughs> so she's asking in the introduction, you said that you hope that the audience enjoyed viewing aspects of your culture. So um, how does horror fit into uh, Lao culture in general? I feel that ties oh. into maybe that kind of cross-cultural understanding maybe that you feel that maybe is lacking maybe that in, 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 in usual senses. <laughs> I mean, I do think that there's an extra layer in this film that if you are not very familiar with Asian culture, much less Southeast Asian culture, um, there might be some details that are missed just because it's so um, significantly Asian, culturally, religious, as well as um, traditionally. Um, but I think that horror really suits Lao culture just because we are such a superstitious people. Um, we still believe in creatures and ghosts and mythical beings. Like, you know, there was that Disney movie, Raya and the Last Dragon that came out. And it was like, we literally still believe that those dragons exist. Like, we seriously have a monument downtown in the city center where we believe that underneath this monument rests one of these dragons, which we call Nagas. Um, it's a Naga, I don't know. like. It, it's a dragon without legs, like, and wings. Um, and Annick, I believe, experienced it for herself, like, when she's been here, that we have every film that we make opens with a ceremony where we ask the spirits to not disturb the sets, where we, like, make offerings to the spirits of the land, um, of the location, to, um, to inform them that if you see, like, something grisly, like our dead bodies, that it's fake and these and to please protect the land and we don't want to disturb them and we ask for blessings um and there have been incidences where like right and like where our crew literally thought they were being haunted <laughs> before um so i believe lao culture is like extremely like fraught and tied into horror um and it's very natural for southeast asians to gravitate towards genre because of this I love that. That's something I actually, like, as a horror fan, that I enjoy about your films, about some of the other examples of Southeast Asian films and horror films, is that just acceptance that spiritual things happen, that there are, you know, it, it, you don't get those exposition scenes where you have to go, oh, is it a ghost? Let's spend half an hour finding out. And you go, it's a ghost. Right. It's you a know? fucking ghost. <laughs> yeah, guys. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Not even explain yeah. it. And you'll find that in a lot of, um, Asian films, not just Southeast Asian. Dentally was one of the exceptions because like I really made the father a non-believer for various reasons. But um, the acceptance that it's just a ghost is there in Asian films. Have you guys noticed, right? And like, when you watch an Asian genre film, like there's no character that's like, ah, I don't think, I think she's insane. Ghost, is she insane? Like, no, every character in the Asian film is just like, ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, Anik, um, do you find, because you, you, you're you a producer and, you, you know, you work on other projects as well, do you find anything, you know, do you find yourself having to do anything in particular when you're kind of moving through different cultural spaces, like if you're working cross-culturally, internationally, how does that come into play in your, in your line of work, I suppose? Oh, you're muted, Anik. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> When it comes down to, to the story, I 100% completely trust uh, Maddie and Chris because that's their world, uh, it's not mine. So um, what I would like, if I get a script from them, I would not look into like the 
fantastic side of it, but I would like look at more like the characters, uh, like um, does it make sense or just look at a little bit of the structure, that kind of stuff. Um, I think that um, where my part of the culture comes in handy, uh, being Swiss <laughs> maybe, <laughs> Is, is more on the production side uh, where I really try to bring in a frame uh, and have stuff uh, like it, it has to be it has to be solid like a production has to be made in a specific way and uh, and like I'm someone who reconfirms confirms and reconfirms and reconfirms uh, I would never like work without a contract um, we've had partners in the past that did work without contracts and that didn't end well. <laughs> Um, so I, I really try to, when I move into a production, bringing maybe that European side of this is how I do stuff is like, as opposed to the Lao way where it's like, yeah, no worries, you know, we'll do it. And I'm like, no, I want to I I say, that. right? Open line. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. so, no, but there's a cultural aspect on set too. And like, you're always having to like explain culture to the other countries. That's true. Because they're on our turf and things work differently in our country. You always have to, every film so far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe like, like we had like a, one thing, maybe you know, when there's a conflict where you know, one culture will, will deal with the conflict in a certain way and then the other culture will deal with it in another way. So it's kind of like reconciling those two sides and be like, okay, this is, that person didn't say anything because of that. And you need to understand that why. And so, yeah, it's kind of bridging bridging the two cultures. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about the sort of actually the, the like mixed genre. We've talked about horror, but actually it's, it, there's a whole mix of genres to, uh, sort of coming into play in The Long Walk. And I just wondered what made you, or not what made you, what, what was your sort of motivation behind your sort of depiction of a, of a present Lao and a near future Lao and how did that sort of, was, was that always your intention or did it uh, sort of develop into the story? That was always my intention, but there were multiple reasons for the mixed genre thing. Um, the biggest one was uh, after Anik and I made Dear Sister, there were a lot of Occidentals that would approach me um, European, especially like the great colonizers, um, who would be like, why wouldn't you like, dear sister is so vulgar, like, it's just like super rich bitch and her super ultra even richer friends um, in the city, they're all like enjoying champagne and they're having like fucking jamón iberico in this like restaurant, you know what I mean? And it was like, why wouldn't you show a more authentic Lao? And I was like, I was showing an authentic Lao, like that's my city. Every location that we were in almost, like that restaurant with the champagne is my friend's restaurant actually, um, is a real location because I've only shot live locations before until Long Walk. Long Walk, um, we actually built that house. But I've only shot live locations before. Every market that you see, every restaurant that you see, every street that you see, every like lady selling lottery that you see in, on screen is a real human being in a real place. And um, I thought it was so absurd that these white people would be telling me what's authentic in my fucking country, you know? I, and I was just like, it made me realize that there is a definite expectation for what is Southeast Asian and what is Lao, you know? Um, especially since my films kind of veer towards art house side, um, it, they, it rides a really fine line between genre and like uh, art, like art house drama. And the expectation, quite frankly, is poverty porn. Every Occidental wants to see that toothless, brown, raisin skin old woman, like uh, trudging with her like mismatched flip flops down the road and then getting like some STD because she has to sell herself or some shit. And then like suffering a long, horrible death and um, whatever, just like super poverty porn. And this is what sells like this, poor sad brown person staring like 10,000 miles at the wind, you know, like for 10 minutes, a leaf blows. Oh my God, it's so fucking deep. Like, and I'm like, why do I have to do that? Like, this is such a stereotype and we have so many more stories to tell. Yeah, we do have a lot of poverty in this country. I'm not gonna lie. We have issues with poverty in this country, but not all of us live in a goddamn hut on a dirt road. 
albeit I'm an expense in my house, I do live on a dirt road in front of a trash canal. But like, look, my walls are cement, you guys. <laughs> I have doors. <laughs> and, and I don't believe that I should be forced to make a story like that. And so like, I was so frustrated with all these Occidentals telling me like the kind of story I have to make to be authentically loud. It's like, you don't have the right to tell me what is loud. I tell you what is loud. So fuck it, time travel, serial killer, ghost film in rural Lao. That's what you get. And that's what you got. <laughs> I love that. I, I think that's such a, I, I'm just really, I'm really grateful to get the chance to hear you say that about your own films. Cause I think it's such an important kind of, an important thing to consider when you're viewing international films, wherever they're from, is that sort of consider like what lens are you seeing them through? And if, yeah, it's really great to hear you talk about that. Um, we've got quite a few questions coming in about the sci-fi and the, like the genre aspects, right? So I'm going to try and I, forgive me the people asking them, but I'll, I'll, I'll struggle to keep up otherwise. So <laughs> I've got a couple of questions. One is asked, one is from Kieran Judge, who says that the film is exceptional. And they're wondering about the, how the sci-fi elements kind of come into the spiritual elements um, and that kind of interplay. Um, and then I've also got a question from someone whose name I can only see as Jam on my screen. So I'm sorry if, if your name is longer. I like it, Jam Sandwiches it too. Jam. It's, <laughs> it's Jam dot dot dot, so I don't know. Um, and they're asking whether there were any particular films that sort of inspired or influenced um, The Long Walk or parts of The Long Walk as well. So kind of a few questions in one there for you, sorry. <laughs> I'll get onto the sci-fi thing, but I'll let Evan do the, which films inspired Maddie Doe first. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> Unmute. Okay. So, none. <laughs> <laughs> because Maddie has absolutely no film culture whatsoever. <laughs> I, mean, I saw that film in the Arctic, and it, that you and the Sitges people told me to watch, where the thing, like, yeah. You know what I'm yeah, talking about? The, the thing, yes. The thing. See, I mean, she doesn't oh, yeah. do, she does <laughs> yeah, do the Arctic. And it, so, uh, so no, Maddie has no culture, uh, film culture whatsoever in terms of like watching all these films, um, which is also one thing that I bring as a producer is like, if I read a script, I'd be like, hmm, this sounds very much like this and this. So it suddenly it's like, what? And then you try, you know, do you make sure that it doesn't. But, um, but which is also a great thing about Maddie because then, you know, she comes in um, with a fresh view, like fresh ideas, and she's not trying to copy something that's already been done. Just like ideas, and then Chris, you know, um, puts them on paper, um, and then we discuss them. But it's not like oh, I'm gonna do something like this film that I've seen like 25 years ago or something. Um, so no, there's no influence whatsoever, I think, from other films. <laughs> but when you tell me that it reminds you of a film, uh, usually like. Chris will t uh, try and find that film for us to watch so that we make sure that it's not too um, similar, you know? So I, my film education is growing because of you. <laughs> well, I put, I put films um, down, I'm like, you should, you know, in terms of like pacing, watch this, uh, in terms of that character, watch this one. So it's more, it's targeted, it's very targeted. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of like that, you're right. Um, and then I'll like discover some small, like interesting new things like about the way a film can be structured or, um, or sometimes it's the opposite where I'm just like, oh, like films are often structured like this, but why aren't they structured like this, you know? Um, and then Anik and Chris are usually like, well, we, we've never really thought about it. Let's try it. And so that is something that I really appreciate Anik and my writer um, and husband, Chris, for kind of going down that road with me where I'm just like, why can't it be done like that? Why not? And that's always the way it is with my crew too, right? Where I don't always understand that there are certain ways of doing things. So I'm like, well, why not? And it kind of makes you guys think about approaching film differently too. <laughs> um, in terms of the sci-fi for Kieran, um, you know, there's a lot to be said about development and modern day advancements where in the old days we thought that a lot of shit was magic right like where we didn't know how something came to be and we always kind of like pegged a supernatural 
element to it before we began to understand that there was a science behind it. And sometimes I myself wonder if like a lot of things that we consider supernatural aren't just scientific phenomenon that we don't have explanations for yet. Um, and I'm kind of, so I'm kind of in this gray zone when it comes to um, belief in the supernatural and belief in the scientific. Of course, I, I believe in scientific, go get your fucking vaccines, people, but um, put a mask on. But I also think that um, it's very jarring to live in a country like Lao where, yeah, I do live on a dirt road and there are certain things that are just still so old fashioned and still so old, like old school, but yet development has come in such an instantaneous matter. You know, you guys had phones, like landline phones, and then that turned into the wireless phone, and then it turned into the mobile phone. And then we had lap, um, computers on your desktop, and then laptops, and then we had 4G, right? Um, Lao didn't have that. Lao went from like landline phones to nothing, 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 to suddenly having 4G, like the world at their fingertips. And you know, you lose something when you make this like abrupt change in your way of life and in your lifestyle. And I think that this is like a lot to do with the long walk where, you know, development in countries like this, like hits you like a ton of bricks. There's no like step into development with here over in a place like this, where it's suddenly like, we are literally um, living in some, in some regions with like no electricity, or like um, no clean water. And then all of a sudden we've got like Porsches parked at a hut or we've got like 4G and every granny is on YouTube watching some soap opera or playing some online game. And there's like, the gap is so huge in our society. And sometimes, um, I don't wanna say that it's not sustainable, but sometimes people get left behind in those gaps. And I really think that this is kind of the long walk in a lot of ways where it's like he went from this little boy in this like extremely agrarian society um in deep poverty to suddenly like modern development just hit him out of the blue and he did not adjust you know like the world moved on ngos came development um organizations came and they're like let us gift you with modernization then let us like get the fuck out and i hope you adapt ciao you know and that's it. And I think that this is um, one of the things that I really wanted to show in terms of the sci-fi in, in this Lao film. That's awesome. Thank you, Matty. Um, so you've, you've kind of talked, I suppose, already about international reactions to your, um, to Dearest Sister. Now you just wanted to ask maybe uh, a similar question that I guess kind of follows this same train of thought about like who approaches a country and how from outside or from inside. I just wondered whether you found that reactions to the long walk have um, been particularly different or how people sort of might interpret the film internationally, maybe in the context of, you know, a film festival versus maybe a theatrical release uh, at home in Laos, for example. The theatrical release has been interesting because to be honest, we have been doing super well. The film was in theaters for more than a month, which is insane for Lao, but it's also COVID times. So, um, you know, we're desperate for content in our cinema and these other countries are not producing as many films or sending as many films over to our cinemas. Um, I do think that that actually, I hate to say it kind of worked out for me. Um, one of the interesting things about the reception of Long Walk is I do think that international people really are able to follow the storyline because they're accustomed to time travel stories, right? And like, you guys have seen so many time travel movies, um, so many complicated timeline stories. And the Western world is also more used to complex stories. So like putting the pieces of the puzzle together um, in a lot of ways was easier for an international audience, including like, for instance, our neighbor in Thailand, like in Thailand, um, this film like basically went viral. It was insane because we have a very similar religion and a very similar language and culture. And they really tapped into this film. Um, but the odd thing is there's a huge, um, 
difference in understanding, for instance, of the ending for Western audiences and for Asian audiences. And this, I mean, all Asians, by the way, like when the old man dies is usually really different for Asian audiences than it is for Western audiences. And I don't want to tell people that they're wrong about, because one of the beautiful things I love about this film is you should be able to come away with your own opinion and with your own perception of the film. But for instance, in my own home, Chris, my husband, who wrote the film for us, um, he also thinks that the old man dies at a different time than I believe. And so here's a director and the writer, like the two keys of the story disagreeing on a very important aspect of the film. And that's fine. Like, I think that's great. But local, local reception has been very odd. I've noticed a lot of people who have like been to the West and lived in the West or have been, um, who have experienced a lot of film or have had higher education are really receptive to the film. But the younger audience who have only seen commercial films, like who've only watched uh, films like, uh, what is it called? Um, that Thai GDH film about that dead girl, Nang Nap. You, you guys have a different name for it, I think, in, in English. Where the girl dies, she's pregnant, the soldiers come home. Um, it played at Fantastic Fest. And um, films like The Shutter or like Bad Genius, um, kind of like blockbustery type, like X-Men and Avengers type films, it is very hard for them. They have not had to watch a film where they had to like pay attention to every detail where they have to focus so hard on the story and where things are not explained to them. Um, that's very hard for the local audience and I don't think they like it. But the, the ones who are more accustomed to seeing many genres of film, many different types of films, and who are also more um, into literature, actually literature, they are very, they, they key into the film. And oddly enough, you guys, country people, Country people have really been getting into the film because all the details about our cultural beliefs um, and our traditions and our religion, they have just been like tuning in to all these small details and they've been getting it despite not having the exposure that these city kids have had. Um, it's been remarkable to see the reaction locally. So a related question that I've got through from the uh, audience Q&A. This is from Mr. Phil. Um, and this might be a question for Anik, actually. I'm not sure, depending how, with different parts of this, uh, is about um, distribution, basically. And, and it's a question about how do you feel about distribution at the moment? Would you like your films to have traditional festival, theatrical, physical releases? This is going to have a story, I can already tell. <laughs> Or would you be happy going straight to streaming, reaching a wider audience, etc.? They do say that they would love to see a Blu-ray release with all yeah. the all the extras and everything on it. Yeah, we love that Any. too. <laughs> Any. Um, wait for the story. So um, yes, I mean, so honestly, um, I think that a lot of in the past, I think it has changed over the last couple of years, but. When Netflix started, you know, kind of financing films, when and kind of buying films from producers, when um, um, when Apple came in and all these um, festivals were seeing these big platforms as and the enemy, because they were like, well, the films are gonna come out, um, it, you know, it's it's um, it's uh, it's going straight to the platform. No one's gonna see it. This is a shame and all. And funny enough, I actually was reading today an interview from, from uh, uh, Jonah Nazaro, who's the, the new director of Locarno. Oh, yeah. Jonah's interview is very that. interesting. Yeah. Um, about she, streaming, uh, right? I totally agree with this. I think that um, what happened is that these platforms came in and started financing films. Uh, but of course, the films weren't going to the theater, which was the. Um, you had to respect the chain, you know, of, of how a movie worked, like production, and then it comes out, and then, uh, uh, and then you have like theater release, and then you have the uh, VOD release, like a TV release, and so there's a chain. And they broke that chain. Uh, so for a while, they were like the enemy. But then what happened is that when all these authors, like bigger names, like, you know, 
Scorsese or Bong Joon-ho and all these people couldn't get their film financed by the studio system because the studio system was like, oh, we're, we're not taking that risk. But Netflix was like, I am giving you the money. Here's 20 million. We don't care. Here's the deadline. We're not going to watch over your shoulder. Just deliver the film on the time, on time. And they did. And then suddenly, you know, everyone was like, wait. So I, as a festival programmer and as a producer, I see them as a studio. Um, I understand that if, you know, they finance your film, they absolutely have the right to, um, to actually just go straight to the, to the platform. But Netflix has seen also because of, you know, the Oscars, you know, they've seen what it could do for them, you know, going theatrical. So, I mean, they've acquired a theater in Los Angeles, they've acquired a theater in New York, sort of doing their releases, but they've also opened up to festivals. Um, so before they wouldn't care in responding to a festival request. And now they're like, no, we actually want our films to be seen before they hit the platform. So now they've understood like it, it, a connection was made between let's see the industry and between these platforms where um, we understand each other. And, you know, it's like me as a producer, if, you know, we're working on a film and, uh, and we're lacking money and, and I'm trying to figure out how to block, like to close financing and I don't get any help from film funds. And suddenly there's a platform coming and saying, we're giving you a million. Um, and I'm like, hell yeah, I'm going to take you a million, you know, and then you can go out on Netflix. You know, of course I would like to see it in theaters, but the film is going to be seen worldwide thanks to the platform. And in the end, me as a producer, I mean, Maddie can respond from, from the filmmaker side, but that's what we want. You know, we want our films to be seen. The Long Walk has the story of, I mean, we have an amazing festival run. Um, you know, we, we worked so hard to get this film out there. We played with all our connections. Um, we were lucky enough to, you know, uh, get it into the Venice Film Festival, Giornati degli Autori. It went to Toronto, Busan. I mean, all the big ones, Tokyo. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have any distribution due to the distributor who, let's say, I think I'm going to say in a very diplomatic way, I do not think they knew how to handle our film. They didn't know what they had in their hands. Um, so unfortunately, um, I don't think that outside of Thailand and, and, and Laos, there'll be a Blu-ray or DVD. Um, unless we're, we're, we're trying to find ways to maybe get into US, uh, but it's it's very long, very long discussions, and um, and so right now the long walk is only a festival film. I mean, you guys, like as a filmmaker, how could you not want someone to like give you a pool of budget and say, do what you want, we trust in you, um, just meet your deadline, and like Anik said. A lot of these, um, a lot of these streaming content providers love festivals as well. Who doesn't want that prestige of playing in a big festival if the festival would have them? And um, I don't know about the UK, but here in Asia, like a lot of Netflix and Shutter and etc., um, these kind of streaming platforms, they play cinema. We get the actual releases of films that have been on streaming platforms because if the streaming platform hasn't reached here yet, or if it hasn't been released in this territory yet, they'll release theatrically before they hit the platform. You know what I mean? So like, um, I, I guess I don't really understand why it has to be such a conflict. This is Pocky, you guys. Do you remember her from the film? <laughs> I was going to say, we've got a cameo from uh, uh, one of the stars right there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just imagining Gaz, who's sitting in the uh, background of this call, listening to you talk about uh, uh, streaming platforms and cinema programming and having a, a slight little uh, meltdown. So I'm glad he's not in on the conversation. No, I mean, <laughs> like, I do understand. Um, I do understand festivals not wanting to play something that's already streaming, obviously, because then it's accessible. It's not special to the festival anymore. I get it. But I'm talking about like, there are these streaming platforms that are willing to hold their release until it plays at the festivals that you want them to play in. Um, for instance, the people at Shutter were very considerate to me about like, okay, which festivals are you going to play at first? Um, and then we'll hold the release until then. And then there was kind of like, oh, but we want to do this for Women's Month or whatever, Women in Horror Month in February. Um, but then there would still be some festivals that wants to play after the streaming platform. They still wanted to, and Shutter was 
very cooperative and collaborative about that. So like gas are not all completely evil. <laughs> Feel bad, just like I'm bad mouthing him when he has uh, no way of answering. But so sorry, guys. He can't defend himself. He's not here. <laughs> Wait, are we talking about Gareth? <laughs> Don't even. He's gonna, <laughs> he's gonna die. Oh, sorry, Gump. Oh, I feel bad. I don't really feel bad. This is great. Um, you don't feel bad. No, yeah. I don't feel bad at all. <laughs> let's be honest. Um, speaking of, so you just brought up women in horror uh, month and things like that, and it's so it's currently. Um, well, we've just had International Women's Day and it's a month now. I hadn't realized it was a month as well and things like this. And I just wanted to ask both of you, really, because it's something that I kind of find myself thinking about a little bit is how do you feel about the sort of various um, kind of narratives at the moment that are around women in film and sort of especially maybe women in genre? Because um, to me, it can often feel like a sort of you know, an ongoing narrative that kind of goes, look, we need more. And then you kind of get a little bit of concentrated attention and then not necessarily any actual progress or development. So I just wondered as, you know, as, as two women in genre, two women in film, maybe what your perspectives on those, those sort of, the sort of publicity and, and the, the, maybe the, the narratives around just it's being a bit a woman different in for Anik in, pro in producing, because I think strong women in producing has been um, common. And so I think it is really different for any. Yeah, except the producers are never really, you know, um, like in the spotlight. But that's no. But then, like, it's acceptable that yeah, a woman it doesn't is even the matter. It's, it's common that a woman as producers, is the you're you're just like you're you're left in the shadows. Um, but I mean, Maddie has been very good, you know, in actually taking me, you know, getting me in the spotlight too. So thank you, Maddie. Um, I'm I'm going to respond and putting my um, my programmer's hat on. Um, because of course, uh, as you know, there's, there's this huge talk since you know the last two years, the 50-50. Uh, we need you know women directors. We need um, we need more films from women, and um, I think it, it's it's a debate that keeps going. And and yes, I am for that totally. Um, but uh, as a woman, I may shock some people when I say this, but um, I will not program bad films directed by women just to make a quota because it will deserve it, it, I mean, it will not serve the women directors who are trying to do good movies and it will not serve a festival to program bad films so um so of course like when i program a festival i will look at at the end like how many films do we have you know from a woman and how many films from a, from, from like from male directors and you know female directors but when I watch a film, this will never be my number one criteria. My number one criteria is I, I sit down, I watch the film, and then I'll be like, okay, who directed this? This is great. Oh, it's a woman. Awesome. Um, it, it is, I think it is, it has a dangerous edge to wanting to meet the quotas. And, and we have to be very careful about this. Um, and I know that, that peers, you know, female peers actually think like me. Um, it's just something that, you know, as, a, as, as like if, if, let's say, if a man says that, immediately it's like, you are a bad man. You, you can't do that as a programmer. And then when we say it, we're like, well, I'm sorry. Like, what, I mean, I'm not, like, we have a certain standard at our festival. Um, if it's about programming films from a woman and you don't care about the quality of the film, I'm sure there's hundreds of festivals out there. There's just women festivals and then just submit to those. But that is very, that you would have to be very careful about that 50, 50 thing. And, and I do also think that it's unfair to use that 50, 50 only for directors, you know, because sometimes you have a team that maybe 95% women and there may be like five technicians that are male, but still they will only look at who's the director behind the team of the film. I hadn't thought of that. That's interesting, but you're right. Like oh, I've started I mean, encountering films where like the majority of the crew, like DOP, art, everyone was like woman. Yeah, you're right. I hadn't thought of that. About the producer like, either. So it could be like two female producers, one female director, um, you know, maybe a female DOP. And then it'll be like, yeah, the female director is great. Or you I would actually like to learn more about like female DOP work because that is such a male dominated line of work. I you think know? it's a more complicated really uh, subject. Again, like it could be a male director, but then you're, the, the rest of the crew is female, but no one's going to look at that because they're only going to look at the director. So, 
I mean, I, on the directing side, would hate it if I felt like I was only chosen because I had a pussy, you know, like that would really suck. Um, like I wasn't chosen because of the merit of my work and because the story wasn't good. But at the same time, I don't need cock and balls to make a fucking film. Like who's holding a camera with their fucking dick? You know, like, are you hanging it off? I mean, the camera is really heavy, you guys. Just the body of the camera alone is like maybe uh, three to five kilos, not including any of the, of the attachments, um, the sound gear and the monitor. Like it's really heavy. And so like, if you are shooting with that thing down there, like, okay, you deserve the spotlight. But at this moment, I don't see anybody shooting with that. So like, <laughs> um, but I do believe in, in regards to what you said, I Annie, mean, I agree with you 100%, but this does put the onus now on a lot of the people who work behind the scenes in sales, distribution, programming for festivals and stuff to try and make an effort to find more of those good female works because yeah, they exist, right? And if you've programmed so many female works, in fact, Fantasia um, Frontiers, which you've been running the project market at Frontiers, had so many women and all the projects this last time, this, this last year that you were um, running it were like fucking incredible. And you, I don't, I don't know what happens behind the scenes at Frontiers, but um, I can't see you being like, I have to have this photo of women. Like, I really truly believe that the projects that you chose were because of the merit of the projects, you know? Um, and there, we exist. There's a shit ton of us women making films and they're good. We just have to get them on the desks of the programmers. And since I've become a filmmaker, I have realized that that's not an easy endeavor either to get seen, right? And it, like, I feel ultra privileged now that I'm a, now that I'm a seasoned filmmaker, um, that people are looking out for my work. So when they hear that there's a new work by Maddie Doe, they actively seek it out. But what about these new women who nobody knows about? Like, this is, this is sadly the new gap and the new um, obstacle that a lot of programmers are going to have to face is how they can discover these new works of women that are fucking awesome because they're out there you know amazing thank you but i'm really glad to get it like i think it's really important to get these sorts of perspectives on it as a, as a topic because i think it's such a like i say such as it, it feels like such a static conversation sometimes that actually you kind of need that that in that kind of approach from people in the industry to kind of move it it's along so and I think, nuanced yeah it is and so I, nuanced i think what I you mean, say Mandy, besides about, women let's talk about the fact that we have women who are transgender Absolutely. or who are people of color who don't always have the same access as everyone else. Um, it is such a nuanced topic and it's um, something that we're going to have to uh, be concerned about for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, accessibility has been a thing forever, right? And it, like, I think I was really lucky in that regard. Um, I was in the right time at the right place. I made a film and to be honest, like there is a huge wave of people now who are concerned about um, having women's voices in film, having people of color helming films. And so I think right now, Anik and I are in a really good position, but at the same time, wow, you guys, I have read some shitty works from like, like I was talking about the unsolicited scripts that come across my desk where I'm just like, this doesn't feel sincere. Um, actually, Anik and one of our best friends, Fabienne, um, watched a movie recently where it just felt forced. It's like, is this a forced diversity card? Like, I always try to have diversity in my films. It helps that I'm making Lao films, so it's going to be diverse no matter what. But when I start making European or American films, um, I will make the effort for the main characters and for the cast to be diverse and for my crew to be diverse. Because as a person of color, I know that this is like a struggle. But if it's forced, it doesn't feel organic. And then you're just like, oh my God, this is so lame. And Anik and I have definitely noticed this where it's like, this isn't sincere. Like you're putting in this uh, person of color, this LGBT character, this female, and none of it makes sense. And it's so forced. And you're just making a movie to rake in dollars at this moment. But you know, that's not the kind of work that Anik and I set out to do. Anik and I set out to do something memorable something unique and something that stands out and stays with people. 
So if it's diverse, it's because it needs to be. And for, quite frankly, like, I think all my cast members will always be diverse because those are the stories that I have to tell are stories from a person of color point of view, being a refugee in America and being a Lao person who's like super unknown in Southeast Asia. We're like the bottom of the barrel in, in terms of where is Lao? You know, it's that place kind of by La or by Thailand, kind of by Cambodia, like we're down there. <laughs> That's amazing. That's such a valid point. I'm going to, um, uh, I'm, I'm just conscious of the time because I think we have an hour, right? So someone can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I'm going to uh, just try and get a few more. Mic, just keep going. Just I know. Yeah, let's keep going. Um, I got I'm my gonna... bottle of sake. It's fine. Like, it's a special <laughs> event. <laughs> Well, good. In that case, people can keep the questions coming. I'm going to pick a few more of the audience questions uh, rather than ask uh, more of my own. So I've got um, uh, Rin, who is asking, well, firstly, they love the film. It's incredible, obviously. Um, they, yeah. So they would like to know a little bit more about, um, you mentioned the film crew feeling that they were haunted on set. I can't remember. I, I can't remember which, whether that was for dearest sister or this one. But either way, can you can you maybe oh. talk about a <laughs> few un, unusual? <laughs> there we go. So, have you got any any uh, unusual stories from set, or maybe the, they're the experiences of 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 your sort of international crew members rather than your stories? Uh, the international crew. <laughs> I don't think that the international crew often feels haunted because, for instance, in Dearest Sister, the Estonians, Estonians were interesting, right? And it, because while they were a very stoic and cold people and very pragmatic, um, they also had this weird animist kind of background too, where they were like very in touch with nature and very in touch with like this, I don't want to say the supernatural, but they also had like a sort of um, animist background too. But there was always these, there were always these sounds because we lived on set in Dear Sister. I didn't, I forced the Estonians to live on the set. So in that house that we shot, like, you know, Jakob's bedroom was art um, director's bedroom. Nok's bedroom was uh, the DOP's bedroom. And then we like threw the sound guy in like the storage closet or something. <laughs> and there were always like these scraping, scratching sounds in the walls. It's like, and the ceiling and it was loud and it was big and thumping sounds and um you know we joked about it being a supernatural force but in the end it was just a really large fucking rat and we called it it was so big that we called it mark's puppy you know like, oh mark's puppy came to visit him last night he didn't sleep all night he's really tired <laughs> but like it was like a possum sized rat um but yeah that wasn't supernatural sorry you guys i'm like veering off subject but for instance, on Long Walk, um, we had a couple incidences. One was like, I thought it was fascinating when we were building the house. Um, the house was an old house that was being sold or condemned um, because the family wanted to build a modern house because not all of us Lao people want to stay in a hut. And um, we found the house and we asked to purchase everything from the house. We were like, we want your wood, we want your roof, we want your walls, we want all of the lumber. And we moved that, we numbered the pieces of that house and we moved it to our private location and rebuilt it on our private location. Um, it was pretty awesome. And I remember when we started to lay the posts, because of course these houses have like the, the stilts, right? The four posts, um, the foreman, put an offering on each corner northeast southwest uh that was relevant pertaining to the post of the house and blessed the ground and we actually like in the rain it was like drizzling rain we actually like knelt and said a blessing and a prayer and made an offering burnt incense before they would lay the foundation and put the posts in so that there wouldn't be any issues um then we had uh what we call the basi ceremony where we, again, we ask the spirits to not disturb us. And then we tie um, blessings like this to each individual crew member for well wishes. And where we keep the string on, um, it's like a cotton string. This is like white gold. <laughs> um, where we tie blessings and wishes of safety to the crew members until we finish the film. And we didn't cut off the string until after the production. But um, the initial production, we had a different crew 
that did not work out for us. Maybe if we have time, Enik will get into that. And um, when we restarted the film, we didn't have another ceremony. And one of our art team guys was on his motorcycle. And while he was on an errand, he ran into an animal on the road fell off his motorbike and broke his leg. And we had, they, we were requested to do another ceremony because we were, it, the belief was that it was bad luck that we restarted the film and we didn't have the ceremony. But at the same time, our producer, our loud producer, Duong Mani said, um, at least after this accident, he kind of took the brunt of the bad luck and he was a conduit of the bad luck and he carried the bad luck away from the film set, which I thought was extremely morbid, but like, I mean, it's kind of accurate. Like the film has had a lot of good luck, right, Andy? <laughs> yeah, so these are some of the supernatural things that happen besides us accidentally hitting a baby cow on the way to set and eating it. <laughs> that wasn't supernatural, that just sucked. Amazing. <laughs> I've got another question here about, um, it's from Kieran again, and it's a great question about... Um, oh, Kieran's like my super yeah. like associative popular fan buddy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question about like kind of, um, I suppose the like international travel of a film, but rather than distribution. Um, and going back to Dearest Sister, it's talking about it as an, um, as a submission for the Oscars. And Kieran's asking, was it exciting and new and cool, or <laughs> are the Oscars a waste of time? And as Bong Joon Ho put it, a local award ceremony. <laughs> What's your okay. view on it? Multiple things, you guys. Mm -hmm. Multiple things. I've met the. I don't know what she is. The director or the president or the founder of the Oscars. Mm -hmm. What is she? I think that um, she's a black woman, really beautiful, authoritative black woman. Is she the director of the Oscars? I, I, can't, I can't remember. I met her. And she literally said in front of an entire crowd of festival people that they call it our night out in Hollywood, like our little night out. So in terms of the fact that it's a, um, a local event, Bong Joon-ho is not wrong. It is an American awards show. It is an American standard uh, event. It is, it is an awards show meant for the States. Um, so even though it's world prestigious and something like this is an incredible, let's not forget that the standard is it's for the States, not even for Canadians because Canadians have their awards show. Um, is it the Canadian Screen Awards? I can't recall, but, um, but like Oscars but, is American. Yeah, I mean, re rebounding on that, um, you know that every country has their Oscar submission. So they have, every country has um, kind of a film, uh, as you say, show. film fund or sort of decides which film they will be presenting to the Oscars uh, as best foreign film or best international feature. Um, in our case, um, we were lucky enough, you know, to, to have Dear Sister being presented as our Oscar entry, our Oscar entry. But what you need to realize is, I mean, because we tried to get some publicity done for, I mean, Shudder had acquired the rights for their sister. So we're like, hey, great, let's do a campaign. And then, and then I started digging a little bit. I was put in touch with a publicist and she was like, what's your budget? And I was like, um, I don't know, 5,000 bucks. <laughs> um, yeah. and, then, and then we got the numbers and we realized that if you really want to try to lobby people, you're gonna need $200,000 to actually interest so, someone or book ads, you know, in Variety, Hollywood Reporter, in all these trades. So um, it's- I was threatened, Annick, it's where there were publicists author. knocking on our door. Remember, yeah. like, it wasn't just that one, like that publicist you spoke to, but I had multiple publicists contact me and they're like, let's run an Oscars campaign. And of course it was cool, Kira. And it was like, yes, oh my God, let's. Um, it was so exciting because how can you not be proud that you're one of the selections to be submitted for the best foreign language picture, right? But um, when people, when these publicists and when these marketing agencies started coming back to us and being like, Oscars campaigning starts at, this is a friendly price, by the way, starts at 150,000 US dollars, starts at to get screenings, to get seen, to have publicity, to be in advertisements, to have like blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, I got pissed. I was just like, 
do you know how irresponsible that is to me as a Lao filmmaker in a third world country? Do you know what that sounds like? That you want me to like try and scrounge up half of my budget, actually more than half because your sister was like 200 something thousand euro. Um, you want me to scrounge up more than half of my budget for a fucking Oscars campaign? It's like, that is so irresponsible. And then, you know what the answer to that was, was, well, doesn't your government have funding for that? Because a lot of, a lot of countries their government will give them grants for, um, for them to run an Oscars campaign. And I was like, I live on a goddamn dirt road. There's like, we are lacking medical and educational infrastructure in this country. And you want me to ask for like 150,000 US dollars for a fucking Oscars campaign. I saw the people that I was up against, you know, BPM, um, uh, The Wound, all these other like incredible films, uh, Leviathan. And I was like, I'm little dearest sister from fucking Lao. Like, I'm not gonna like burn. It would be literally like setting fire on 150,000 US dollars when there are children here that literally can't eat. You know, like how irresponsible is that? And they were like, you're never going to get seen. No one's going to write about you. Like, no one will ever hear about Dear Sister, and it's going to go nowhere. Um, and I was like, fine. I don't fucking care. Like, Shudder has it. They're distributing it. I don't care. We play at our festivals. I'm satisfied. In the end, any, like, we actually got a ton of press attention. Like, didn't we? Like, we had, were in the news everywhere for, like, because we were Lau's first submission to the Oscars. And I just found it really, um, really shocking that people would treat us like that. We're like, oh, you're never gonna get seen. No one's gonna write about you. You're, not, you're gonna just like disappear. And of course we didn't make it to the short list, but you know what, to be honest, like I love my film. I think it's great. I do think that it's funny when people realize that it came before Parasite and stories are quite like, the struggles and the challenges are similar because it's an Asian society struggle and obstacle, but I'm not fucking deluded. I didn't deserve to be in the short list. And the amount of publicity that I got just being one of the one of the submitted nominees was just like, I'm so proud, I'm so happy. But the the structure behind it, Kieran, is not cool. But the honor of being one of the selections is like, it's something that I will remember forever. And it, I will go to my grave being proud of that. Like it's probably once in a lifetime. I don't know if Anik and I will ever have a film that gets submitted again. So for me, it's something that's very special and like insanely honorable. I'm so happy, but I'm so glad I didn't have to go through all the like fucking circle jerk. <laughs> I've got another question. Thank you for that. That's, that's like, it's a, such an incredible insight. And I like that it's kind of a, a, a complex insight, right? Because you've got those like dual dual feelings around it. Um, I've got another question from the audience from Alexander Griffiths, who says, thank you so much for an incredible and chilling film. I was curious as to what the biggest challenges you faced as a producer and director, sort of generally in your careers and what advice you would give to aspiring directors and producers. <laughs> well, uh, this film was not uh, like, <laughs> It, this well, film was like the craziest in terms of challenges. Like this yeah. film nearly died, you guys. You guys don't even know any, like this film like nearly died. It was circling the drain, right? <laughs> um, okay, we have to be very diplomatic here. Um, Try. No, we have to be diplomatic. So the biggest challenge generally for a producer is finding the right partners to make your film, right? Um, we had challenging partners um, to a point where that's a, word. That's a euphemism. <laughs> yeah. um, to a point where me as a producer who um, was not to put, supposed to put any money into the film had to open up my savings account and take 40,000 out to make sure that the production wouldn't stop. Uh, I did get my money back, uh, but that was over a period of six or seven months of threatening emails going forth and back. Um, and they didn't want to give you your money back, by the way, for that. So I, I don't want to go into details, but I, um, 
my advice to any producer, um, aspiring producer, is to make sure that whoever you're going to work with, um, make sure that first of all, you have a very, very solid contract and you have mm -hmm. someone and draft your own contract. <laughs> don't don't yeah. accept anything that comes from that partner if that partner wants to come on board. You have to have your own contract. Um, and then make sure that everything goes by a written way. Um, you, you need a trace of whatever you're discussing. Um, in our case, at some point, we, we didn't know if we would be able actually to finish the film. And the only reason we were is because we got selected um, at the Venice Film Festival, Giornati degli Autori, which we could use then as a leverage to basically say, um, we need the money. Uh, or we have to cancel the invitation from Venice, which for our partner was like, why? We This is Venice. We can't say no to Venice. And we're like, and Maddie- I can't say no to not paying my technicians. Like, Sorry, you guys. So Sorry. We, that helped us. We had the leverage, but we know of other people who were in similar situations, who, you know, never got their money back, um, who never got to finish their films or completely lost their films to their partners. So the challenge on this one was, really the collaboration with partners we thought were um, solid and honest and it turned out to be the exact opposite and we the the, the struggle became trying to finish the film to um, waking up every morning to a battery of emails that were mean and um, and just trying to, and harmful really in terms of like directing for aspiring directors. Um, first of all, like, I really believe strongly in this, even though I talk about how Anik and Chris um, and other people who have basically made me a filmmaker, like Todd Brown and et cetera, believe in my auteur vision, believe in what I'm doing. Don't be a dick. Like, you don't make a film by yourself. It is your vision, but at the same time, like an entire team executes your vision. You know what I mean? And so like, I, I have this encounter with a lot of young directors or people who come out of film school who believe that the world like revolves around them. But the reality is an entire team makes a film and it's such a privilege to make a film. Like, um, as you guys can see, Long Walk is a very intimate film. It's a very personal film. It's a film about my mother and my, um, and my dog dying. Um, and it's a film that is a basic fuck you to like Occidentals that are telling me what I should do in Lao. But at the same time, I'm not blind to the fact that it's just a film. You know, like we have people in the medical field right now who are combating the pandemic. We have people, our garbage men keep our streets clean so we don't have plague rats running around. Um, I always give this talk to my new film crew when I meet, um, when I bring, I guess you could call it an orientation. When I bring new foreigners into our film crew, before we start this, this um, shoot, I give them the orientation that we are, all, we are less important than garbage men and prostitutes because like garbage men keep our streets clean, keep our lives livable and prostitutes let us rent love temporarily. And at least they give something back to the world. Like what are we giving back? Like two hours of fucking entertainment. You know, even a prostitute gives us more entertainment than two fucking hours. So like, I think, I think for an aspiring director, understand that it is your vision. It is your story, but it's up to you to elevate that story and transmit it with your team and not be a dick about it. Like the world does not revolve around you. And to take a business class or two, or to run a small business and understand that everyone is not there to cater to your whims. Like when you have a budget, um, you need to understand something about producing you can't make everybody bend over backwards for you. You can't step on everyone. Understand a little bit of everyone's job before you go into directing um, so that you don't come on set and be this like crazy fucking tyrant. Anik, who has been on my set before, has seen that there is a familial equality. We're like brothers and sisters on our set. Everybody is almost like we're basically equal. We discuss with each other the problems and challenges that we're facing. And there's no like diva attitude. And because of that, I think that the film is better for it, right? I think like we we work together to solve our problems. There are no like, I need that, I need that fucking dolly and I need it now. I have to have that 6K 
camera or I can't make a film. It's like, you know, there's a fucking door. Actually, there's a door. <laughs> Walk the fuck out because there's so many other people who have stories to tell. Um, and I know that's really pessimistic and cynical, you guys, but I come from nothing. I don't come from a film background. I come from a really um, proletariat dance background. And uh, my father is extremely blue collar. And every day I'm so grateful that I can do something like this. But when I speak to other filmmakers, God, sometimes they're just so entitled and douchey that I'm just like, <laughs> it's no wonder that like you don't go far, you know? I hope that's relevant. <laughs> I think that's very good advice. That's good advice for everyone, never mind directors, right? <laughs> I think that's good. Don't be a douchebag. <laughs> yeah. I've got one last audience question here, which um, is again, again, kind of taking us back to the, the sci-fi. And it's a question about using uh, like special effects and CGI. And um, it's from uh, Chris Corbin. And then again, the name is being cut off. So it's, it's Chris Corbin, something else. Um, mm. How... Ah, you can see. Why does my screen not show? Thank you, Annick. I Chris can't see it. <laughs> So, oh. how was it using the CGI special effects, and um, what's it like trying to find the right people to do those effects, and for a good price? Chris Corbin Green. It's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were really fortunate um, that our DOP has a strong VFX background. Um, Annick we lost our old DOP for various reasons. Diplomatically, Enik has required me to say for creative purposes, we separated. Creative differences, excuse me. I need to rehearse that. We separated because of creative differences. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And um, the new DOP that we had, um, Enik was desperate finding referrals from everywhere. We had Todd Brown and Enik, um, looking for DOPs from all over the world and just like it was insane because we needed to pick the film up um, within a certain amount of time because we had all this foreign crew living in Laos at the time and they had return tickets home and we had to finish the film before the return tickets home and um, Aaron Moorhead and Justin Benson from the film uh, Spring and Syn Synchronic recommended this American DOP, a young guy. It was his first feature film, but he had a shit ton of experience in VFX and that helped a lot. He could understand the things that we had to face and then the, sort, the way that the shot needed to move or be structured to be able to assist and aid the, the CG artist. For instance, like um, if we had to key something in, uh, you know, the interaction between a character and the object could not cross. And this is something that I didn't understand as a director until he had told me. And that could have been like a bitch for the CG artist. But to be honest, um, due to timing, it was difficult for the CG artist. They gave us an extremely good price, but there were a lot of communication gaps with our CG artist. And um, because of the timing and the fact that we, our partners didn't, didn't exactly pay us on time to finish the film on schedule, the schedule that we desired, their schedule got filled up and things got clusterfucky. So it was difficult, um, Chris, but um, this is terrible. I probably shouldn't say it. There were a lot of the effects that my own husband and our friend Abel worked on together. Um, and we inserted into the film because when I wasn't satisfied or when I wanted when I had like a very strong idea that was hard for me to convey and hard for me to relay. Um, at the end, we ended up doing quite a bit of it as well ourselves. But part of the goal of the long walk was always to keep it in a scope where we knew it could be affordable and that if it came, if worse came to worse, that we could possibly pull it, some of it off ourselves. So the cost was actually really um, not horrible. And I'm super grateful. Like that, that jet, our Thai CG crew did it. Um, I think I worked with them for weeks just to get the, the cloud trail to fade away just correctly. I'm like a really detailed bit to you guys. At the end of the day, like I know what I want and it could just be a jet streaking across the sky with like that fucking cloud trail, the solid in the air. It had to dissipate like from end to front. And when it pierced that cloud that it went into, there had to be like this 
of cloud, you know? And I think like the render time and the, just the amount of dedication put into like getting what I needed and wanted. Um, I think that like my CG team were really annoyed with me in Thailand, <laughs> but they're proud of it. They're happy with it. And that's what matters, right? Again, it's that auteur filmmaker thing. And they like really fostered it. And so I'm very particular about small details like that. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so I think I'm going to ask one more question to wrap things up, even though I think we could keep asking for stories for hours. Um, but before I ask that question, uh, I do want to say thank you for not only your time today, but like your insights into this particular film, your particular careers into the whole landscape of like global film culture. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, but I kind of, I started things off by asking about your collaboration. So I suppose my last question, it's a predictable question, but I feel like you kind of have to ask it to wrap up, right? Is what are you both up to next? And by both, I kind of mean you as a, as a, as a collaboration, <laughs> but maybe also if you have several projects, those two, but in particular, what, what is next for Annick and Maxi? We have some crazy shit, Annick. <laughs> we are at this moment too, super crazy fucking projects. Um, because Long Walk was just so personal. Um, you know, you guys, I still cry when I went to Long Walk, but particularly at the end, um, I think it's, it's such a bittersweet, tragic, but like lovely ending. And then when the mother dies, because I modeled the death of the mother after the death of my own mother, I held her hand while she died. And um, I wanted to do something lighter. I just wanted to do something more straightforward, something more direct, something that wasn't such a like complex um, and painful experience. And so we have a film that we're working on now called The White King that is about um, sex pets. It's a creature feature. And usually, you know, creature features involve like werewolves or like monsters and vampires. But in this film, the creature, the monster are those nasty occidental sex pats, those fat, nasty old white guys that come to our country for sex tourism. They've come for, to fuck around with prostitutes, to take advantage of impoverished village girls. Um, and sometimes they aid in a bet trafficking and um, in places like, well, here in Cambodia and Thailand as well, in many countries in this region, um, sometimes they uh, are pedophiles. And so I'm, I'm finally taking that disgusting aspect of the people who come here and abuse our people and making them the monster, making them the creature. Um, it's a little more straightforward than the long walk for sure. It's like a Stephen King movie, right? I make mean, like kids versus this nasty creature. <laughs> yeah, and then and Annie can like, do something a little deeper and a little more complex, which is entanglement. Which that's great. We presented for at the uh, the Macau International Film Festival at the market last December, and we won the. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah um this is really very like, exciting i like um, i feel like i never win anything but holy shit like things have been wow we won an award for um development of the film which is one of the hardest awards to win is for development you know <laughs> yeah but this one has been put a little bit on the back burner because it's a it's a it's a, a film that takes place between the us and thailand and because of the covid situation right now uh That's not great right. in the back burner and then we'll concentrate on the white king you know everyone keeps telling me that oh it's fine there's productions happening it's okay but then i look at the like half million dead in the u.s i look at the thousands per day oh. cases and then i look at lao where life has gone back completely to normal where like we're freaking out because we still we got three active cases this last month like three cases oh my god it's hard for me as a Lao person to be like yeah, we can still do production in America. Yeah, it's fine. I don't think it's fine. Um, but, you know, with vaccinations happening, et cetera, hopefully things will change. But the reality is um, it won't be an easy production with a COVID situation. Um, even Thailand recently had a second spike, um, which was 
not their fault, to be honest. Um, the second spike happened from shipping boats, like seafood shrimping boats, and people who are like kind of uh, working in uh, foreign waters, like international waters, and getting exposed to different people all around the world and passing the virus on. And so their second spike came like really suddenly and they're getting that under control now, but at this moment, it's just not, I, I don't want to be responsible for some kind of outbreak, even if it's like not a huge outbreak. I don't want to be responsible for the sickness or the loss of any crew member's family. You know, So I really have to think about that. But the White King is extremely more possible because Lao is COVID free. Um, we haven't had any COVID deaths. Um, we're running around, we can't travel out and people can't travel in without a uh, clearance and quarantine. But because of that, we've been able to keep COVID at bay, you know, and like I said, life is completely returned to normal. We only wear masks as a courtesy, like in a taxi or in a market, or if you feel sick. But I think Mia, Mia who has seen my social media, it must be shocked, right? Because like I'm going to concerts, the fashion shows, uh, we're having huge parties. We're hugging on each other. And yesterday there was a concert that we had that was a one year anniversary since our lockdown. And it's we have to remind ourselves constantly that the rest of the world has not gotten there yet. Um, and so to do a film like Entanglement that would require multi nations and a lot of traveling, I'm just not comfortable with it yet. Not yet. But it's pretty fucking awesome. <laughs> it's pain twinning you guys um and it keeps telling me it's a very cronenberg film but i've only ever seen one cronenberg film so i don't know <laughs> i love that i love that that brings it right back to that sort of understanding or knowledge of film but i think it's really exciting like annick was saying earlier when you have a sort of fresh approach to things because you know like someone like me who is a horror fan can hear the name cronenberg and go oh yeah I'll watch that you know it sounds like something up my street but I love that it is bound to be a fresh take so even if we have to wait a little bit longer for uh, the next projects because of everything and I'm trying really hard not to be really envious of everything you just said about how well uh, Lau has coped with the current yeah. situation here and in I the UK apologize, you guys. <laughs> don't apologize don't no, apologize no I post well. photos on Instagram and also I used to not anymore I used to get comments where they're like oh my God, you're not wearing a fucking mask. And it's like, you know. Like, I don't know how to tell you this, but we, yeah. I don't know how to tell you this, but uh, Taiwan, New Zealand, yeah. and Laos, it's a little different, it's a different world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for your time today. Like, I am so excited that we got to show the film um, and that, you know, hopefully lots of people will be watching it as part of WOW and that we as Abattoir have been able to have this conversation with you today as part of WOW and I, I can't wait for the next one, I suppose. So it's weird not have, asking everyone to kind of like applaud you with me, but I know they're out there. So applaud amongst yourselves. We'll hear you, <laughs> you know, it's all good. Um, but yeah, so- Thank you guys Annick, so much for watching the film. Like it means so much to me and any, you know, to do we do such an obscure film from such an obscure country and to like hear the responses it's oh it's super incredible it's it's so incredible I can't I still can't believe that my film can reach people like for instance an aberyst with <laughs> thank you so much for having us like you know yeah. we love you guys and you know you, you've been very supportive from, from the very beginning so uh so anytime anytime <laughs> and hopefully you guys after right. the pandemic is over we can come and see you guys in wales it would be incredible yes. i would we would have so much fun we can drink the local brew together and spend like all night partying and talking about film we, hint hint we would make great journeys <laughs> <laughs> hello i noted <laughs> did you oh, hear that garris we would make great <laughs> Jury members, workshop leaders, we can teach all y'all how to make a film with just your DSLR camera. We can do it. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. I'm sure that Gareth is listening intently behind the scenes. Um, Bring us but to yes, Wales. thank you everyone for joining us to listen as well. And join thank us you guys so next much. time when Anna and Matthew are here in person. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much for having Take us. Take care, everyone. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye. Okay.